January 22nd, 2021. We are still in RT210D, pulmonary mechanics. We went over a lot of information yesterday about some of the basics, a couple of physics laws that we learned. And today we're gonna to go into the actual lung volumes and lung capacities. Your homework last night consisted of um, one and two and would have been really grateful in helping you prepare for today. Uh, again, yesterday I told you you're gonna to have to learn how to uh, define each volume, each capacity. You're gonna to have to know how to tell me how much is in it uh, and how they correlate to FRC compliance and all of that, okay? All right, so what we're gonna do is pick up where we left off. All right, we talked about that. Now we'll talk about lung volumes. The lung volumes relate to a lung thorax relationship, okay? We talked about there are two opposing forces inside of your body as far as your lungs are concerned. You have a thorax who wants to spring out and a lung who wants to collapse, right? It wants to shrink in. And those two opposing forces keep the lungs open at all times, okay? That's when we got into our intrapural uh, pressure. Um, talking about the pressure inside the pleural space is what becomes more negative when the diaphragm descends and makes the lungs fill up. When the pressure inside the lungs is lower than the ambient pressure air has to go in, right? And then when we exhale, the diaphragm ascends and it becomes a slightly positive uh, pressure inside the lungs, which is higher than the ambient pressure, so air has to go out, okay? So today we're gonna to talk about in those in and out, right? That ventilation that we talked about, remembering that ventilation and oxygenation are two different things. We're talking about ventilation, right? There are some numbers and some um, different volumes and capacities that we have to talk about, all right? And that's what we're going to get into today. Now, I'm going to go over the four volumes and capacities. The uh, PowerPoint was, I told you, look at the PowerPoint last night. If you looked at it, you were able to see them. Hopefully, you studied them and commit them to memory. You have your IRV, which is your inspiratory reserve volume. The definition of IRV is the maximum inhalation following a quiet inhalation. Remember when we said quiet and normal are the same thing, okay? When you take a breath in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out those are quiet breathings, okay? And so what they're saying is IRV is after you breathe in normal or quietly, you suck in more air as much as you can suck in. That amount above that quiet breathing is called your inspiratory reserve volume. And it is 3.1 liters, 3.1 liters. All right, I'll show it to you on the... All right, so our lung volumes are inspiratory reserve volume, your tidal volume, your expiratory reserve volume, and your reserve volume, also known as residual volume. Okay, also known as residual volume. Now, on your worksheet, if you saw VT, then I'm, I'm sure that you were able to understand that that's tidal volume. I don't know why it's backwards, but for the most part, it will always be VT, that's tidal volume. But if you see TV, that's the same thing. They, they meant the same thing. All right. So let's look at it. Uh, the way they are arranged. In the middle, you have your tidal volume. That's your normal end. You follow my marker. Normal end. Normal out, normal in, normal out, normal in, normal out. That's my tidal volume, okay? 
which is about 0.5 liters or 500 milliliters, right? So inspiratory reserve volume is after I normal in. Now, after I take a normal in breath and then I suck in, suck in, suck in, suck in some more, then that volume that I sucked in above the normal in, a quiet in, is my IRV, inspiratory reserve volume. Okay? Now let's talk about this one. This is my expiratory reserve volume. This is the maximum amount of air that I can push out after a quiet out, right? Or a quiet exhalation. So it's normal in, normal in, normal in, normal out, normal in, normal out, normal in, normal out. And after my normal quiet exhalation, I push, 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 as far as I can go. That amount that I was able to push out after a quiet exhalation is called my ERV, which is expiratory reserve volume. And it is 1.2 liters. Now, what about this one down here? The reserve volume, also known as residual volume, is the amount of volume left in the lungs no matter what. You cannot access RV. There's no way you can push, 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 push far as you can push. You would never be able to get rid of the reserve volume, also known as residual. Volume. That means the volume that's left over after the maximum. So the volume left in the lungs after a maximum exhalation will be your reserve volume. Still there. Can't get rid of it. Now, it does get knocked out of you sometimes. If you've ever been doing something, you fail and got the wind knocked out of you, and you, uh, uh, it took you a little minute to get your breath back, that's because you got that reserve volume knocked out, okay? So if you get have a wreck or you fall flat on your chest or on your back and you get the wind knocked out of you or somebody hits you in your stomach really hard uh, and you get the wind knocked out of you, then that takes a little minute to get it back, that's that reserve volume that they knocked out. But on your own, you cannot access it, okay? You cannot access it. So these are my four lung volume. Tidal volume is 0.5 liters or 500 milliliters. Inspiratory reserve volume is all the air that I can breathe in after a quiet in, okay? And it is 3.1 liters. And then my ERV is all the air I can push out after a quiet exhalation and that is 1.2 liters. And then the air that's always remaining in the lungs, no matter what, is the reserve volume, which also is 1.2 liters, okay? Yeah, inspiratory reserve volume. After you breathe in normal, you continue to breathe in as much as you can suck in. That is your inspiratory reserve volume. All right, so those are our four lung volumes. Now we gotta talk about the capacities. You need to know that two or more volumes equal a capacity. Two or more volumes or capacities added together is and make capacity, okay? Now we're getting ready to start adding some of these volumes together and they will give us an overall capacity of the lungs. Okay. So before I go to the before I go to the next slide, capacity to inhale would be this would be my capacity. Um, tidal volume plus IRV will give me my inspiratory capacity, right? And that is my capacity to inhale total from baseline, okay? So normal out, I suck in tidal volume and then I keep on going IRV. Those two together is my inspiratory capacity. I see, that will be my inspiratory capacity my tidal volume plus my IRV. That is my capacity to inhale. So if you look at it like this, normal in, normal out, normal in, normal out, 
Now, after a quiet out, everything that I can suck in after a quiet exhalation. See, this is the quiet exhalation. Now, if I start from baseline, everything that I can suck in, that's tidal volume plus IRV, is my capacity to inhale. So that would be my IC. And we're going to get to that slide in a minute. I just want to kind of get you to understand how it's working before we go on to the next slide. Inspiratory capacity. And it is 3.6 liters. So think about it. 0.5 plus 3.1 is what? Point five tidal volume plus three point one. Three point six liters. Okay. So inspiratory capacity will be from here all the way up here. That's my inspiratory capacity, which is my tidal volume plus my IRV, which is three point six liters. Now to the important one. My expiratory reserve volume plus my residual or reserve volume is my FRC. The FRC is all of the air that I can push out plus the residual volume is my FRC. Or you could say the, the air that's left in the lungs after a normal out. See, normal in, normal out, normal in, normal out. Now, after this normal out, everything that's left in the lungs is my FRC, because that is my expiratory reserve volume plus my reserve volume. These two here is my FRC. And that's why it's so important, because after a resting exhalation, my FRC is my expiratory reserve volume plus my reserve volume. But this is why it matters, because if you are a copd -er, they have a higher FRC, right? You said that COPDers will have a higher FRC because when they normal out, they don't get down to baseline like we do. They're just way up here somewhere, right? So they have a larger FRC because they have an obstruction. They can't get the air out. So when they have a normal exhalation, their numbers are higher than yours and mine because we don't have obstruction. So that's why the FRC is perhaps the most important component of this whole spirogram, FRC. That is the air in the lungs after a quiet exhalation. These definitions are very important because if you say it wrong, it's wrong. All right, now I'm gonna ask a couple questions. I'm gonna say the word, I'll say the definition. I'm gonna ask you to tell me what it is. Okay, I wanna tell you to tell me what it is. Here it is here again. Same thing, but just as the waveform. So you can see it a little better. When I was saying tidal volume or VT was in and out, in and out, that's normal in, normal out. See, normal in, normal out, normal in, normal out, normal in, normal out, normal in. Now, if I go from this normal in, all that I can suck in after a quiet inhalation is my IRV. See, from this line up, this amount, this amount here is my IRV. And then if I do normal in, normal out, normal in, normal out, normal in, normal out, normal in, normal out. Everything that I can push out after this exhalation, so this will be normal out right here. All the gas that I can exhale after a quiet out, this amount right here would be my ERV. And then there's still some air floating around in the lungs at all times, and that is your residual volume. So I said my capacity to inhale would have to start from the baseline of tidal volume, so it can include tidal volume plus IRV. That is my inspiratory capacity. There is a YouTube link up here. I don't know if you guys looked at it or not, but there's a YouTube link here that also has another people explaining the spirogram. Just select it. It should be a live link. Just hit it and it'll take you right to uh, that link. Now, so I'm gonna ask you some questions. I'm gonna say the definition and I want you to tell me what it is. All right, let me see some faces. All right.
All right, first question is for Brittany. The amount of gas, the amount of gas inhaled and exhaled during normal quiet breathing, which one is that? Brittany. It's the... Uh... Normal in, normal out. Normal in, normal out. The amount of gas breathe in during quiet breathing is called the what? I think it's got an FRC. Oh, at the FRC. That will be your tidal volume. The amount of gas moved, the amount of volume moved in normal quiet breathing. That's quiet in, quiet in, quiet out. Quiet in, quiet out. This gas amount is my tidal volume. Okay. okay. All right, Kelsey, uh, the gas that is moved, or let me say this, the amount of gas that can be inhaled after a quiet inhalation would be my what, Kelsey? ERV. Listen to me. The amount of gas that can be inhaled after a quiet inhalation would be what? IRV? <laughs> IRV. Inspiratory. I said inhaled. If I'm saying inhaled, I'm talking about inspiratory. Okay. IRV. That is the amount of gas that can be inhaled after this quiet in. See, these are all quiet in. Quiet in, quiet out. Quiet in, quiet out. Quiet in, quiet out. Quiet in. And if I keep on inhaling after a quiet in, it's my IRV. Inspiratory reserve volume. That is all the gas that can be inhaled following a quiet inhalation. All right, Lori. What is the amount of gas moved? Or the, let me see, let me try to say it right. The amount of gas that can be exhaled following a quiet exhalation. The amount of gas that can be exhaled after a quiet exhalation is called the what? ERV. This is quiet in, quiet out. And if I keep on pushing, the gas that I can exhale after a quiet out is my ERV. All right, Michaelin. What is the amount of gas left in the lungs at all times? 1.2 liters. No, no. I said, tell me what it is called. What is the name of it? Oh, uh, the RV. RV, reserve volume, or also known as residual volume. Good. All right. Now let's look at this. Talisha, what is the amount of air that can be moved following a quiet exhalation? So let me say this. The amount of gas that can be inhaled following a quiet exhalation. So the amount of gas that can be inhaled after a quiet exhalation, what is that called? Expiratory reserve volume. Mm, I'm saying inhale, guys. Y'all not, not listening to me. The amount of gas that can be inhaled after a quiet exhalation. So that would be from here all the way to here and up here. Oh, what? IRV. Uh, IRV, what is it, uh, Brittany? I mean, uh, Kenya. Mm -mm. I see inspiratory capacity. I told you inspiratory capacity is tidal volume plus IRV is my inspiratory oh. capacity. That's my capacity to inhale. My capacity to inhale. Hmm? I Mm-hmm. Now, uh, let me see who else is up here. All right, Christian, uh, can you answer, Christian? Yes, I can. All right. Okay, Christian. Uh, the amount of gas that can be exhaled 
following a quiet exhalation is what? The amount of gas that can if, be- You can keep going, I'll listen. The amount of gas that can be exhaled after or following a quiet exhalation is what? Is it a um, kind of functional re, uh, res, residual capacity? No. no. The question says the amount of gas that can be exhaled, how much that you can push out after a quiet exhalation. So after this quiet exhalation, oh. how much can you push out? Is it 2.4 liters? Uh-huh. Not, not the amount. I want to know the, 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 the word. ERV. ERV. So y'all follow my, uh, oh, okay. my, my, uh, my pointer here. This is normal in, normal out. Normal in, normal out. Normal in, normal out. This whole little section of normal in, normal out is my tidal volume. Okay? Resting in, resting out. Quiet in, quiet out. All that's the same thing. Normal in, normal out quiet in, quiet out, or resting in or resting out is the same thing, okay? It's my tidal volume. Now, I want to know, I asked you, after a quiet exhalation, this is a quiet out, the amount that I can continue to push out after a quiet exhalation would be my ERV, okay? And then if I said the amount of air that I can continue to inhale after a quiet in, see? So quiet in and I keep on going, then this amount is my IRV. And then if I want to know my capacity to inhale, well, that would be my tidal volume plus my IRV. And the words that you would have to say is the amount of gas that can be inhaled following a quiet exhalation. After I exhale, and then I suck in all I can do, that's going to be tidal volume plus IRV, right? So I hope you guys are going to have to study this spirogram because students that memorize the spirogram and know every component of it do exceptionally well going forward because these are the mechanics of the lungs, okay? If you can't master this, you're going to have, you're going to struggle, okay? This is, this is, this is one of the, very important components of respiratory. All right, let's keep going. What time is it? I think it's time. Hold on. I'm behind. My watch all long. 128. All right, hold on one second. I want you guys to do right now before we take our break. Uh, put your desk wherever you are. You're going to take a pop quiz. Once I open it up, you only have four minutes to take it. So you won't have time to try to study and try to look up your answers and all that. It's four questions. 25 what did you points say? Piece. I'm sorry. My, it was breaking up. <laughs> oh, I said clear your desk. You're going to take a pop quiz. You have four minutes to complete it. This is going to towards your RT two ten K homework section. You get the K. You have homework for all these sections, right? I'm using quizzes to fill in for the K section. And all the quizzes that you do that I give you, I'm going to have it up. What? Yes, great. No thank you, breaking up. Clear your desk. Clear your desk. You're about to take a quiz. Okay. You only have four minutes to take it. Everybody needs to cut their cal- their computer uh, their camera on. I mean, set this timer on it right quick, and then I'll open it up for you. Is it going to be in Canvas? Yep. Hold on one second. Yep, it's going to be on Canvas. That way I can it can be part of the grade. All right, let me see. Four minutes.
All right. Uh, go to Canvas. Go to back to the module, guys. It's under the module that we're in. At the bottom, it says Pop Quiz number one. Pop Quiz one. That's where you're going to go. Open it up. It's open now. You have four minutes to complete it. But you, you don't have your camera on, man. I think everybody got theirs on. A couple people don't have theirs on. Stephanie, Yasmin, Courtney, put your computers on while you take this exam, this quiz. Now, you only have four minutes to take the test, but it's open till 140. So you got eight minutes before it's completely gone. So open it up and knock it out, and we're going to take a break. Again, you got two minutes, and, the, and that quiz will end. Take a break, come back at two o'clock, and we will continue on with the capacities and go over the homework from last night. If anybody had any questions on the homework, we'll knock out a few of those and continue on with the lesson at 2 p.m. For once and for all, let's get it understood that right-sided heart failure is called core pulmonale. It happens because of pulmonary diseases. Pulmonary circulation is the right side of the heart. It takes deoxygenated blood, from the right ventricle to the lungs to pick up the oxygen, okay? Left side heart issues will be something like CHF, systemic heart failure, right? The left side is the systemic side. It pumps blood to the rest of the body, all right? Now, the other thing was the electrical pathway. The electrical pathway starts with the SA node to the AV node to the bundle of his down the left and right bundle branches. And then the last step is the Purkinje fibers. Some people put bundle of his. You, you skip two whole other steps, okay? You gotta go back and look at this stuff. That's why we're doing these pop quizzes. And I told you they will be comprehensive in nature, making, making you go back and study the other stuff. All right, and last one was Poiseuille and Laplace's law, which we talked about yesterday, but I've talked about Laplace for a minute. You should know that Laplace is talking about the surface tension of bubbles, right? One big bubble will suck in the little one. So in your homework, it says how it pertains to respiratory, right? I told you his law wasn't, wasn't a healthcare law. It was just simple physics law. But we utilize it in respiratory as we talk about the collateral ventilation between alveoli. A larger one will collapse a smaller one because of Laplace's law. But since we know that, and that is true, your creator has made surfactant in your body to make the surface tension be equal. And now that the surface tension is equal, no matter how big one is and how small the other one is, it won't collapse it, all right? And then Poiseuille talked about the diameter. If you decrease the diameter by one half, you increase your resistance by how much? 16 times, that's that's pause a lay. Okay, pause a lay. All right, keep going. Now, as far as that homework, let's look at homework number one from yesterday. And I'm not gonna go through every single one. I only go through the ones that you say I got a problem with. So if anybody have a problem with anyone from one through 20 on homework number one, if not, we'll go on to homework number two, which we'll do more of that today. You know, you, like I said, do the best you can. So any questions on number one? Huh? Numbers. Go ahead, man. Number 16. 16. Uh, the, the device oh. used to measure VE. I just want to make sure I got it right. What'd you put? 
bio resention. Re- I don't know how to pronounce it, honestly. No, I don't know where you might have saw that at. It might you might have been misunderstanding that. The device we use to measure uh, ventilation is called a Wright's respirometer. A Wright's respirometer that would have been in your reading. It's called a Wright's W R I H. I mean G G H T. Wright's respirometer. That's how we measure the volume in and out your, your mouth. You just breathe in it, and it has a matter of fact. I think I got one. Do a pulmonary function study that's got all kinds of stuff. If you put right respirometer, that's fine. But that bio, whatever she was saying, I don't know what that. You might have been. Are you saying body plasmograph? I think you, so. Plasmograph. Now I can. I would take that. A plasma. That's a body box where they actually get inside this closed um, box, glass box, and they put a mouthpiece in. It can measure all of it. The body box can measure everything. Okay, in a pulmonary function test, we put the patient in a closed in box and they sit in a chair with a big mouthpiece in front of them and the PFT respiratory therapist will do all type of studies. Okay, so yeah, that's fine. I, I didn't know what you were saying, but yeah, body plasmograph, P-H-Y-E-S or something like that. That is a body box. So yes, but basically for bedside, we use a Wright's respirometer and this is what it looks like. This is a respirometer. Okay, and if they do as they will, these are very expensive, but you would, they put a mouthpiece on here and they will blow into it and you tell them to breathe in and breathe out. So you breathe out and this little dial will go around and tell us how much, how many liters did you just exhale? Okay, that's called a right respirometer. All right. Any other questions for, for the homework number one? Yeah, I was a little confused between number two and number 13, the algebraic formula for compliance and the basic formula. Okay. Two and what? Two and 13. What's, what are they asking? Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, the basic, remember the basic one, the basic formula I believe they're looking for in uh, that one would be change in pressure over change, I mean, change in volume over change in pressure. I think that's the basic one. Let me see if there's a number for the other one. And then the number, I assume they meant uh, where you said CL equals total pressure over total volume? That's not total, baby, that's change. Oh, change, okay. Change in pressure over change, the, uh, the formula for compliance. What's the formula, guys? Change in change volume. In there you go. Change in volume over change in pressure. That's the that's the formula for compliance. Now they may be asking for the the algebraic one. Let me see if they got something different. And can you do number eighteen after that, please? Don't worry about the algebraic one. I don't know what they want you to put right there. Just change in volume over change in pressure. That is the basic compliance. So they may have been asking for um, uh, the dynamic or the static and all of that. So just just the basic formula for compliance is changing volume over changing pressure. What number? 18. All right. What are the normal values that give us a normal VQ of 0.8? That's going to be what you'll learn a little bit more today. Was uh, it ventilation uh, perfusion ratio? Yeah, ventil- yes. Okay. That's so what I thought. Number? What numbers did you did you find the numbers? No. Anybody find the numbers? Okay, that's okay. I found four over five, which that's makes it. point eight. That's that's it. It's four liters of alveolar volume to five liters of cardiac output. Remember, we said cardiac output is how much blood that the left side of the heart pumps out per minute, and I said it's five liters. And I showed you these water bottles. I had all these water bottles. I said that's a lot of blood that's being pumped out every minute. Right. Well, a good VQ ratio would be five liters of cardiac output. Right. And you have 
to four liters of alveolar volume, minute volume. So that's saying you got good perfusion and good ventilation. Good perfusion, good ventilation. That makes a good regular VQ. But when, we, when, when things change, when we have dead space unit or a shunt unit, then you're gonna have a mismatch. There's gonna be either no alveolar volume and a lot of blood, or there's gonna be a lot of ventilation and no blood. That's a problem, okay? And we'll get into that more, uh, should be today. All right, so good. Anything else? Can you uh, go to number three? Number uh -huh. three. Did somebody say one and two? Number three. Oh, number three. I said number three. If a tube decreases, if a tube decreases to one half its diameter, how much more difficult is it to pump gas through it? 16 times. That is Poiseuille's law. If you decrease the diameter by one half, you increase the resistance inside by 16 times. That's Poiseuille. Okay. Any more? All right, now I'm assuming you know all of these rest of them. If you have no question, I'm assuming you know these. Number three and number 14 was pretty much the same question. Mm -hmm. Was number 11 negative four centimeters the water? Or yeah, I, think, I think so. Let me look. Yeah, it's pressure, so you know how to read it in pressure. Yeah, those are the, opposed, opposed, the two opposing forces that's in your notes that was over on, uh, let's see, two opposing forces, yeah, negative four to negative five centimeters of water at rest. Yeah, slightly negative, uh, negative four to negative five centimeters of water at rest. Those formulas for minute ventilation and all that, we're gonna go over that today. All right, what about homework number two? You need to know, you need to know the amounts. Yes, I don't care how you remember them. If you, if you know the milliliters, you should know the liter. That's, yeah, that goes without saying. But yes, you need to know what they are and how much they are. So for uh, our number, volume, go ahead. I was going to say number three on homework number two. I got a negative four millimeters of mercury. Normal intrapulmonary pressure. That's a negative uh, five, ain't it? Intrapulmonary pressure. Look at your notes where it says uh, intrapulmonary uh, pressure. Isn't it negative nine? I think that was a negative five. It's like on the first sheet. Negative five on the power. I thought point. it was a negative nine at first too. And so okay, I look, back at listen, this. listen. You have a intrapleural and you have an intrapulmonary. Those are two different things. Intra, intrapleural, that's inside of the lung. And intra, intra uh, I mean, intrapleural is inside the pleural space, and intrapulmonary is inside the lung. Those are two different forces. I mean, two different pressures, right? Two different spots. You got pressure inside the lung, and then pressure in the pleural space. Okay. The question says, what's the normal intrapleural pressure at rest? So, normal intrapleural pressure, uh, intrapleural was negative nine centimeters of water on inspiration and negative five on expiration. So I should have put both of them? Either one would have been fine, because set at rest. So I, mean, I don't know if they saying after I inhaled or after I exhaled. Right, because they never right. asked internal or external. Either one of them would have been fine, but you need to know there is a difference between intrapleural and intrapulmonary. All right. All right.
What about then, number five? Now, for that interpol, they do get more specific in the notice. In the notes, it does tell you right here. It says plural as negative four to negative five at rest. So I wouldn't have taken off if you wasn't sure, but this is the definite answer. Negative four to negative five centimeters of water at rest in the plural. What was that number? Five. Changes in FRC are indicative in changes of what? Compliance. 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 Compliance and FRC are directly related. So if my FRC changes because my compliance changed. Number what? 10. Oh. Number two. And that's where you list the uh, the values for each one of these above. Oh. Yeah, that's when you have to tell me the values for title, volume, ERV, IC, FRC. We're gonna go over that today. Uh, right now, that's what we're doing today. All right. Well, let's keep on going. Mm. In my PowerPoint. All right, so we just talked about showing the four lung volume, right, and their amounts. Inspiratory reserve volume is 3.1 liters. Tidal volume is 0.5 liters. Expiratory reserve volume is 1.2 liters, and reserve volume is 1.2 liters. So the FRC will be what? How much will the FRC be? 2.4 liters. 2.4, because that's this plus this. What about the IC, inspiratory capacity? How much would that be? 3.6 liters. 3.6, because 3.1 and 3.5 is 3. I mean, 3.1 and 0.5 is 3.6. All right. Another way to remember inspiratory capacity, I don't know how old y'all are, but I had one class that told me, she said she best way she remembered that was saying that uh, that group 36 Mafia, the rap group, IC36, what she said. She said, oh, she was at the mall in IC36. So that helped a lot of people remember. So, I, you know, I passed that on. Anytime you come up with something like that, I pass it on to all my classes. All right, we did this one already. Now, they're talking about it. These are the definitions. Inspiratory reserve volume is maximum inhalation following a quiet inhalation. See, after this quiet inhalation, after I inhale quietly, then I maximally inhale after that, that is my IRV, and it is 3.1 liters. Tidal volume, the volume inspired or expired during quiet breathing, the in and out, normal in, normal out, normal in, normal out. It is 0.5 liters, and that's 500 milliliters. So make sure you're able to convert from liters and milliliters. All right. Expiratory reserve volume, ERV. Expiratory reserve volume is the maximum exhalation following a quiet exhalation. So after I exhale quietly and I was to keep on push, 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 that is my ERV. Maximum amount of air that can be exhaled following a quiet exhalation. All right, and it's 1.2 liters. Reserve volume. The reserve volume, also known as residual volume, is the gas remaining in the lungs after a maximum exhalation. So after you push all the air you can push out, there's still some left. And that's this right here, the RV. And it got cut out, but yeah, that's RV. Oop. All right. 
Now, we're going to talk about capacities. Capacities consist of two or more volumes or capacities. When we start adding volumes together, that's capacities. Or if we add capacities together, that can be another capacity. Now we're going to talk about capacity. First one is, oh, well, here they go right here. IC is inspiratory capacity. FRC is functional residual capacity. VC is my vital capacity. And TLC is total lung capacity, all of it. Now, this chart here helps you see uh, when they're added together. Okay, now let's look at the capacities. Inspiratory capacity, which is 3.6 liters, consists of tidal volume and inspiratory reserve volume. All right. The functional residual capacity, which is 2.4 liters, consists of ER, ERV and RV. My vital capacity, write this down, is everything you can do. Everything that you can do is considered your vital capacity. And what I mean by everything you can do, look at right here. Starting, starting at a, let's just say we're starting at a baseline of quiet out, right? Everything I can suck in and everything I can blow out, right? That's all. That's my vital capacity. Starting at baseline, everything I can suck in, 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 and everything I can blow out, 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 blow out. That's my vital capacity. Notice that reserve volume still there. <clears throat> and finally, your TLC or your total lung capacity is everything. My vital capacity plus my reserve volume will give me my total lung capacity. Fire around once again with the capacities. Now, this IVC, this this vital, they're talking about your inspiratory vital capacity, but it should just be VC. That's the same thing, vital capacity. Everything you can do. So everything I can suck in and everything I can blow out. That's this session, vital capacity. Now we can start working on some uh, addition and subtraction. Because that's another way that you can tell me. If I say, what is this? You can tell me by using addition and subtraction. Okay? And I'll show you in a minute. All right. Let's talk about the capacities. And then I turn this off and go on the board. We can work out, show you some things on the board of how uh, to use um uh, adding or subtracting to get your places, okay? So inspiratory capacity is my IRV plus my VT. IRV plus VT equals IC. See, IRV plus the VT will give me my inspiratory capacity, my IC. See that? IRV plus the VT is my inspiratory capacity. It is my maximum inhalation following a what? Quiet exhalation, right? It's all of you. Got to make sure you don't say, oh, maximum inhalation uh, following a quiet inhalation. If you say that, that's IRV. Okay, you, you got to you got to include that vital tidal volume. Okay, so the maximum inhalation following a quiet exhalation is inspiratory capacity. It starts right here, which is your quiet exhalation. We do tidal volume plus IRV, give me IC. FRC. My FRC is my ERV plus my RV. Gives me FRC, see? And that is the gas in the lungs following a quiet.
quiet exhalation. After I quietly exhale, what's all left in my lungs? ERV plus RV. That's what's left. That is my FRC. So ERV plus RV give me FRC. Okay, normal 2.4 liters. Vital capacity, this is everything you can do, right? A couple ways to add this, but IRV plus VT plus ERV, that is my vital capacity. See, my vital capacity. Wait a minute, I got somebody in the chat. Brittany, you can't hear me? I don't know why my mic is on. Let me write her a note right quick. Must be on her end. Cause can everybody else hear me? Yes. Yeah. All right. Hold on. All right. <clears throat> so yeah, maximum inhalation, the vital capacity is maximum exhalation following a maximum inspiration. Okay, a maximum exhalation following a maximum inspiration. All right. And then total lung capacity is every single thing. It is IRV plus VT plus ERV plus RV. All of it will be my TLC, which is about six liters. Your total lung capacity is about six liters of gas. So uh, now they're talking about FRC and compliance. How important FRC and compliance are because they're indicative of each other. FRC is the most consistent volume diaphragm at rest, all right? When the diaphragm is at rest, everything that's in the lungs at that point is your FRC. FR, at FRC, you have an equalization of opposing forces, the pulmonary and thoracic elasticity, right? That's when they're opposing. We say we have two opposing oh. forces. The rib cage or the thorax wants to spring out, and the lungs want to collapse in because of elasticity, right? So as they work on each other, as they work on each other, then uh, that is at zero, like ground zero. That's your FRC. Hello? Yeah. All right, mute your mic. Whoever just came in, mute your mic. All right, so at rest, <clears throat> when those, those forces are opposing each other and are holding each other hostage, right? They, they got them in an even teal, that's FRC. That's where they're equal. The, uh, the, the, the thoracic force and the uh, pulmonary force are equal at FRC. Now, as elasticity changes, the FRC will change, right? Because we talked about uh, elasticity as it, com uh, as it compares to compliance, okay? So what do we say? If the elasticity increases, then the compliance does what? Decreases. 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 
Compliance is the ability for the lungs to do what they want to do. If you turn up the elastins, then the ability goes down, right? The compliance goes down. If the if the if there is a decrease in elasticity, then there will be a what of compliance? Increase. Increase of compliance. Good. Increase of compliance. So that's what we're seeing with COPD, guys. People who have COPD, which are those C-babe diseases, what's happening is their lungs are slowly losing their elasticity. They are becoming more and more floppy. Emphysema, which is the last disease of, of the C-babe diseases, is nicknamed to be floppy lung. Okay? As the alveolar walls begin to stretch more and more and the elastic fibers are starting to be worn down because of smoking and other issues, the lung becomes more and more floppy, so the elasticity is going down. As that happens, the compliance is going up, okay? The FRC is going up because they can't blow it out. So instead of them blowing like this, instead of you and I blow like this, right? Normal, we get all of the air out. When they exhale, they... It stays full. They can't get it out because it's obstruction. Obstructive diseases like COPD, they can't get it out. So when they come down or when they exhale, their FRC is larger than ours because we can get ours out. They can't. And since they can't get it all out, they're building up what? CO2. There you go. So they are always hypercapnic. COPD patients are always hypercapnic. All right. Now at FRC, intraporeal pressure is normal about five centimeters of water. And in your book, it says at rest, the pressure, the intraporeal pressure is about negative four to negative five centimeters of water. That's at rest. And we said FRC is when those forces are at rest, equalization, right? When you exhale and you're just sitting there you have an equalization of those opposing forces. That's at rest, okay? And at rest, the intraporeal pressure is about negative four to negative five centimeters of water. All right, at FRC, intrapulmonary pressure equals ambient pressure, right? Because we said the only way for gas to go into the lungs or out of the lungs, there has to be a change in what? Pressure. Pressure. It has to be some type of change. Either it's going to be a, a change to make it come in or a change to make it go out. But F FRC, which is at rest, the intrapulmonary pressure is the same as the ambient pressure. So nothing's moving. Gas has no reason to, to run, right? It just stays right even at rest. FRC is the amount of volume in the lungs at rest. <clears throat> All right. Now, with an increase in compliance, right, which is a decrease in elasticity, an increase in ease of inspiration, but difficulty to expire, expire which is floppy lung. See, as the compliance gets higher, and the elasticity is going down, right? It's getting like old draws. It's losing all of its snapback, right? Well, it's easy to inspire. They can inspire all day long. But when it comes to expiring, it's hard. They can't get it all out because the lung is just floppy, has no elasticity to it. That's what an increase in compliance. When you have an increase in compliance, you have a decrease in elasticity, right? And when you have a decrease in compliance, you'll have the uh, you have a decrease in the ease of inspiring. That's a stiff lung. See, when my compliance goes down, now my lungs are stiff. It's going to be harder for me to suck that air in, right? Because my lungs are tight. Whether it's a disease or whether it's a skeletal deformation or whatever the problem is, the restrictive problems, 
cause it hard for you to take a breath, right? That's a restriction. So remember that pink book when I had this stuff on this board over here yesterday. This is very important to make sure you quiz yourself on this so you'll understand the relationship of it. Don't forget this relationship. COPD or any obstructive disease, right? Whether it's emphysema, what's another uh, COPD disease? Bronchitis. Bronchiectasis. What's the C-Babe diseases? Huh? Cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis. fibrosis, right? You gotta make sure you remember, you memorize those C-Babe diseases. You got COPD, baby, right? Those are C babe diseases. So any of the C babe diseases will give you an increase in FRC, an increase in compliance, but a decrease in elastin. That means it's getting floppy. The elastic is going away, right? It went from a broccoli, a broccoli rubber band to an old scrunchie that you didn't have since you was in middle school, right? Don't hold your hair no more because it's just lost all of its grip, right? And if you have a restrictive disorder like skeletal scypho, uh, kyphosis or scoliosis, pectus uh, para paranitum or pectus excavatum, pulmonary edema, pulmonary fibrosis, any of those consolidation, right, that we had in the notes, they cause a restrictor, make it hard for you to get the air in. So when you have a restrictive disorder, you have a decrease in FRC, right, a decrease in compliance, and an increase in elastins. All right? Elastins is inversely related to what? Compliance. Inverse. If elastins is going up, compliance is going down. Okay? All right. All right, FRC is directly impacted by the compliance. We already said that they, they are directly related, right? If you have a decrease in compliance, that's a stiff lung. A decrease in compliance is stiff lungs. An increase in compliance is a decreased elasticity or floppy lung, okay? If the lungs are stiff, then the alveoli are harder to inflate, right? Uh, and if the alveoli are not inflated, then the FRC is decreased. That's because they're saying you can't even get the air in. So there's nothing left to be in there because you couldn't get it in in the first place. That's why the FRCs are lower because they can't get it in from the first place, okay? And it says, what can we do? What can we do as therapists to help alleviate and fix those things. All right, let's go on with the notes. Make sure we didn't miss anything. Here goes the four volumes of capacities. I think you've already written this down. Uh, it's in the PowerPoint, exact same thing. Here go the capacities. You can go back and pause this because we just went over all of this. And this. This is stuff directly from here straight into the PowerPoint, guys. Exact same stuff. All right. Now we have to get into classifying this ventilation. This is where it starts to get a little arduous. This is where the math comes in. But it ain't a lot. It's just if you don't if you don't know the formulas, you can't you know you can't do it. You gotta know the formula. You gotta know what goes where. Now, I'm going to show you, first of all, uh, the first thing they're going to talk about is what something called minute ventilation. That is the amount of gas that goes in and out of the lung in one minute. Okay? So, for minute ventilation, And this will be on that whiteboard that I gave you. All these formulas are on that whiteboard. 
but mid ventilation means you have to have frequency and tidal volume. Mid ventilation is B with a dot in the middle and an E. Let me put the share on so you closer for you to see. Minute ventilation is a B with a little dot in there, E equals frequency times tidal volume. Now, on some of the worksheets, you're not going to see that dot because there's no way to put the dot on Microsoft, on Word, right? There's no way for me to put that dot in there on Word. So you may just see that B and E, you got to know which one they're talking about. But a V with a dot and an E equals frequency times tidal volume. That is the tidal volume times the frequency. How many times are they breathing per minute? If they're breathing 12 times per minute, then I do 12. And they have a tidal volume of 500, then I can say 0. 0.5, right? Equals what? Anybody? Six. Six. Six liters per minute. Six liters. If somebody is breathing 12 times a minute at a normal vent of tidal volume of 500 milliliters, which is 0.5 liters, the answer is six liters per minute. When you do, when you put the volume in here, you need to put it as the decimal so it comes out as a as liters. But if you didn't, that's fine. You would have got six thousand. That would have been 6,000 ml, and you need to change that to six liters. All right. So, question What would be the normal minute ventilation range? Tell me the normal minute ventilation range, knowing what I just told you. Now you're going to have to go back and, and in your mind and say what the normal uh, rate is and what the normal tidal volume is, right? I want it to, at the at the front end and on the higher end. Matter of fact, we just did the low end. We did 12. All right, so don't say it out loud, but tell me, I want to know what is the normal range of minute ventilation? The normal range. What is the normal range for minute ventilation? You have to tell me. You do know. You already know. You already know. I need the range from smallest to the greatest, knowing the range. Put it in the chat when you got it. Michael, and that looks good. I think that's right. I don't know where y'all getting five from. Five's too low. We just did the low end with 12. Frequency, you gotta first know what's the normal frequency. You gotta tell yourself, oh, the normal frequency is this to this. So um, let me do the low, the low end, and then let me do the high end, and this is the range for minute ventilation. And the tidal volume, you want that just the normal tidal volume, right? Tidal volume, yeah, I want to I wanna know the normal. All right, just making sure. Yeah, that's fine. The normal tidal volume, uh, and I want to know the range. What would what, that range be? First, you have to tell yourself what the normal respiratory rate is. What is the normal adult respiratory rate? This to this. And then you take the first one, 
times the, times the normal tidal volume, and then you do the second one times the tidal volume, and that's your range. So I think I got a couple people write it in there. Let's do it. First, what is the normal range for frequency? The frequencies, what's the normal frequency? 12 to what? 20. 12 to 20 breaths per minute. That's the normal. All right, so let's do the first one. 12 times 0.5, we said was six liters, right? And then we do 20. 20 times 0. 0.5 is what? 10. 10. Ladies and gentlemen. So the normal range for minute ventilation is 6 to 10 liters per minute. <laughs> that is the normal minute ventilation. Anytime they are more than this or less than this, then we can start making some assumptions. All right, so now that we know that the normal minute ventilation is six to 10 liters per minute. You got it, Kim? I'm not gonna write this far. I'm just gonna write now that we know that the normal minute ventilation is about six to 10, then if let's say, Mr. Smith has a minute ventilation of 25 liters per minute, what can we say Mr. Smith is doing? Come on. Hyperventilating. He's hyperventilating. And so we since we know he's hyperventilating, we know his CO2 is what? What what's uh, number? Uh, what y'all say? Higher CO2. No, not gonna have a high CO2. It's dropping. There you go. Less than what? 35. 35. So he is hyperventilating hyperventilating and his CO2 would have to be less than what? Good. And his PaCO2 would have to be less than 35 what? Millimeters of mercury. Good. These are the assumptions we can make guys with um, with the minute ventilation. See how they come together? We know that the normal respiratory rate is 12 to 20. You just gave me the normal minute ventilation with the normal tidal volume, right? Six to 10. If Mr. Smith's minute ventilation is all the way up to 25, you said he's hyperventilating. And if he's hyperventilating, we can assume his CO2 is less than 35. All right, what about if Mr. Smith has a minute ventilation of, let's say you got him, you tested his minute ventilation, his minute ventilation was three liters per minute. What is he doing? Anybody else? Hypo. There you go. Hi. Hypoventilating, and we can assume that his PaCO2 is what? Greater, Greater than, than 45. 45 millimeters of mercury. This has nothing to do with his oxygenation. Remember, that's two different things. We're strictly talking about ventilation. So that's how we can use minute ventilation to quickly decide whether our patient is, is, uh, uh, is hypercapnic or 
hypocarbic, right? Or eucapnia, right? What if his minute ventilation is eight liters per minute? Mr. Smith's minute ventilation was eight liters per minute. So we can say he's what? Huh? Eight to ten. I mean, yeah, he's eight liters per minute. What is he doing? Ventilating. Yeah. No, what type of ventilating? No. Isn't it dipenia or dice or no eupenia or something like that? Yeah. Eupenia. Yeah, eupenia. Eight to six to ten is the normal. He's eight, so he's normal, right? So this is just eupenia. Eupnea, normal breathing, and we can say that his CO2 is P, A, CO2 is got to be what? Between 35, 35 40. to 45 millimeters of mercury. Normal. We don't know exactly what it is unless we get an ABG, but we know it's got to be normal because he's, his minute ventilation is normal. So if his minute ventilation is normal, then his CO2 is going to be normal. Okay? That is minute ventilation. What's the formula? Frequency times tidal volume. Okay? Frequency times tidal volume is for minute ventilation. I'll leave that one up there. Now, let's take a break. It's 55 after. Come back at three. Come back at 305. We're going to take a break to 305 and we're going to keep going. All right, guys, we got to get back on task. Just to remind you, we are on 210D. Your Egan's uh, reading is in, comes out of 6, 11, and 20. Homework 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. We've done 1 and 2. I may do the rest. I may not. So just make sure you do. Uh, it will be something every day. So don't try to go ahead. And um, you can if you want to, but just you know, be mindful. I might not even ask for it. But working on it is, is always good. All right. Uh, so we will continue lecturing today. I mean, Friday, today's Friday. Today, we have lecture on Monday, and then the test is on Tuesday. You come in, take your test, and go home. There is no lab, so you come in at your uh, group's time, take your test, and go home. After that, uh, Wednesday, we'll be going into acid-based chemistry. That's when we'll start dealing with ABGs, talking about the blood in the artery and how we fix it, Okay. All right, so just reminding you on that. Let's go back to the lesson plan. All right, so we talked about the minute ventilation. Minute ventilation is the amount of gas moved in one minute. Showed you a couple examples. It's the frequency times tidal volume. We can measure it with a respirometer. That was one of your questions. This respirometer of rights, they got the the uh, volume bellows, a vented comp bag, uh, the Drager, but the main one you want to see is the one that is the Wright's respirometer, and this one actually is a meta shield, but the Wright's respirometer is what we use to measure minute ventilation. All right, now, now we have to talk about, break it down. Let's break down that ventilation. Minute ventilation is the movement of gas throughout the whole lung in a minute, right? However many times you breathe that minute. So now we have to break down the types of ventilation. We got dead space ventilation and we have uh, alveolar ventilation, okay? I wanna show you uh, the difference. Dead space volume, right, is the part of the minute ventilation that is wasted. 
That means it does not actually reach the alveoli where external respiration occurs. That's the dead space part, okay? And there are four types of dead space. But before we get to that, those four parts, I want you to see this, what I put on the board. The dead space volume consists of everything from the trachea down to the parenchyma, right? From the, from the start all the way down to the parenchyma. This is the conducting zone, right? We said gas in this zone only is conducting, getting to the alveoli. And when we reach the respiratory bronchioles or also known as the parenchyma, that's when we get into our, uh, what's actually taking place in gas exchange. Only the gas in the parenchyma is taking place in gas exchange, okay? So if I wanna know what is only the alveolar volume or minute ventilation, then I'll have to subtract the dead space from it, right? If I, I just showed you when we did this right here, that shows you everything, okay? Minute ventilation is everything. But if I just wanna know how much uh, how much ventilation is happening in my alveoli? Well, then I have to subtract away the conducting zone, which is the dead space. I have to get rid of the dead space to find out how much of this total minute ventilation is actually participating in gas exchange. Okay, so I'm showing you. You how said we the it. dead space was from the trachea to the parenchyma, or before the parenchyma. To the parenchyma it stops at the parenchyma. Before the, you know, right there at the parenchyma, you have your conducting zone, then you have your respiratory bronchioles. At your respiratory bronchioles, when you start to see gas exchange, right? Everything above the parenchyma is simply conducting your nose, your mouth, your throat, your trach, your left and right main stem bronchus, your bronchi, your bronchioles, terminal bronchioles, all of that is simply conducting zone. That gas is not is not participating in gas exchange. Therefore, it's wasted, right? And anytime it's wasted, it's considered to be dead space, right? There's no magic happening in the conducting zone. It's simply just moving gas to, to get it to the parenchyma, okay? When it gets to the parenchyma, then it can start participating in gas exchange, all right? So they're gonna have some times you're gonna have to know the difference between minute ventilation right, and alveolar minute ventilation. That is what I wanna know just what's happening in the alveoli. I don't care about all of this, right? So you'll have to do some subtracting. You gotta subtract the dead space away from your numbers, okay? So you're gonna find out how do we know what dead space is? You're gonna find out, there's a formula for that. All right, here we go. <clears throat> now, Speaking of dead space, it is the ventilation that is wasted, right? It does not reach the alveoli where it, it to take place in gas exchange. There are four types of dead space. You have anatomical. Anatomical dead space is that conducting zone I just showed you. The, uh, it is the, the air that fills the space in the conductive airways. That's anatomical dead space. Nothing wrong with that. That's how we were made, right? It's not something saying that it's negative. It's just that anatomically, it does not participate. There is no gas exchange in the trachea. There is no gas exchange in the left and right main stem bronchus. There is no gas exchange in the bronchi, bronchioles, terminal bronchioles, right? And there's no gas exchange there, simply by anatomy. But when we get into the respiratory bronchioles, then we start seeing gas start to exchange. Okay, so anatomical is the first one. Now, you can also possibly have alveolar dead space. Hmm, well, how could we have alveolar dead, dead space? Well, you can have an alveoli that is full of ventilation, but there is no blood around it. There is no capillary perfusion next to it, so therefore it's wasted. Okay, it's wasted. It's kind of like having a store. If you have a store full of goods, right? Say you have a store that's full of goods, stuff that you've made and all that, right? You got it ready. But if you don't have a customer to come pick it up, then your stuff is wasted, right? You just wasted all that time and money stocking your store wide open. Here you go, world. 
and nobody comes knocking at your door. Then all that stuff you just bought is wasted. Okay? So if I have an alveoli, here we go right here. If I have an alveoli, that is full of volume, right? But there is no perfusion on my red. Remember we said the alveoli have capillaries all around them, right? Like, like being in fishnet stockings, all those capillaries that are around it. But if I don't have, just say the blood flow is kind of like this, it's spotty, right? If there's, any, if there's not any perfusion around this good old open alveoli, that's considered to be dead space. This is dead space. It's wasted. The, the ventilation that I inhale, the oxygen, all that's sitting right there, but it has no blood to go get into, right? The blood didn't show up. That's called alveolar dead space. Anytime that the, anytime that the ventilation is wasted or not taking place in gas exchange, it's wasted. It's dead space. Okay? So not only do we have anatomical dead space, which is simply by anatomy, the conducting zones, right? That's anatomical dead space, but then they can be some alveolar dead space. And we have a good old alveoli that is fully ventilated, but there is no perfusion around it. Okay, That's a dead space unit. Okay, You're going to see units a little later, but we talked about units before. This is a dead space unit because it has ventilation, but hardly any perfusion, okay? So we're gonna be looking at the V Q problems, All right? In this one, we happen to have plenty of V, but no Q, right? We don't, we said V is the alveolar volume and Q is what? What is Q, Kelsey? Michaelin? It would have to be the blood, the arterial blood. Yeah, the perfusion. Ventilation to perfusion. VQ is ventilation to perfusion. We need to have four to five. Four liters of alveolar ventilation to five liters of cardiac output. In this alveolar unit right here, we have plenty of ventilation, but hardly any blood. See that? The spots. It's barely any blood flow. So that's considered to be a dead space unit. You got ventilation, no perfusion, that's dead space. Write that down. Ventilation without perfusion is dead space. So that's a dead space, a, another type of dead space, alveolar. That will be considered to be alveolar dead space. The third one is physiologic dead space, which is just a combination of the anatomic and the alveolar. So when anatomic plus alveolar dead space equal physiologic dead space. You okay, Ms. Williams? Okay. And the last type of dead space is mechanical. And this is anything that I add to the breathing circuit, okay? So everybody look at me. If you have a patient that's on a ventilator and they have, you know, the, the tube going all the way to the machine, right? Well, we have anatomical dead space, which is the upper airway all the way to the conducting zone. That's anatomical dead space, right? But what if I add more tubing to the circuit? So I said, that ain't enough. Grandma wants to be in the living room instead of the bedroom. So we got to add more circuit to her system, right? Well, the gas that's inside of this, is that participating in gas exchange? No. There's no blood around this, right? This is mechanical. This is anything I add. I added more tubing. Therefore, this is more dead space that I'm adding, which is mechanical dead space. Okay, now these little units you will see on the circuits, they have those smooth ends that you can cut. Each section is 50 cc's of dead space. Okay, 
each one of these little sections of tubing that's going to smooth to smooth. You'll see this a lot because you can't cut in the ridges. You have to cut the tubing at the smooth ends. Okay. And when you add something to somebody's circuit, each unit that you that you add, each one of these sections is 50 cc's of dead space. All right. Write that down. Y'all looking at me, but you're not writing. 50 cc's of dead space for each one of these sections. Of this, and these sections are called mechanical dead space. So I might ask you when we start doing formulas, I say I added three more of these. Now what is this alveolar mini ventilation? You got to know how much to add for dead space in order to subtract it from the rest of it to get your alveolar dead space or your alveolar mini ventilation. Okay? You said 50 cc's? Yes. Each section is 50 cc's of dead space. Okay, so you got anatomical dead space, which is the uh, upper airway or the conducting zone, right? All of the conducting zone is not taking place in gas exchange, so therefore that gas is in there is wasted. It's dead space. Alveolar dead space is when you happen to have a alveoli that is ventilated, but not perfused, right? That is an alveolar dead space. Dead space is considered to be VD. That is dead space. V and a D. V, D. Dead space. Now, how much dead space? How, how do we know what the dead space is? Well, this is the formula. Dead space is one cc per pound. Dead space equals one cc per pound of ideal body weight. 1 cc for every pound of body weight. That's how you can calculate their dead space. If no, now write this down. If no weight is given, if they don't give you a weight, then you are to assume 150 cc's of dead space. If no weight is given in the problem, then you are to assume that the dead space is 150 cc's total, okay? You go by the weight, but if they don't give you a weight in the problem, then you have to just use the normal, which is 150 cc's. So 150 is the dead space and they don't give you a weight, then 150 cc's will be your dead space. Okay, that will be what it is, okay. It's one cc per pound. So if they 200 pounds, their dead space is 200 cc's. If they weigh 80 pounds, their dead space is 80 cc's, okay? But if they don't give you a weight, they don't tell you a weight, then you use 150, because that's the normal dead space, all right? But believe me, they're not gonna give it to you in pounds. They're gonna give it to you in kilograms and you're gonna have to convert because it's one cc per pound, not kilogram. All right. All right. So 
So what they're saying here is dead space is simply the volume that you, you want to rebreathe it. Because when you inhale, right, and stop, you got some down at the bottom, you have some that's going to be right there in the trachea, right there in the top, right? And when you exhale, you're going to exhale some of the same breath that you just, I mean, when you inhale, you're going to inhale some of the same breath that was already in your tract. But like I said, I don't know why they put that in there. Don't even worry about that. It's a little confusing. But bottom line is you have four types of dead space, anatomical, alveolar, physiologic, and mechanical. The normal dead space is one cc per pound of ideal body weight. The reason why they say ideal body weight is because it doesn't matter. It goes mostly on you should weigh a certain weight for your height, okay? to find ideal body weight. Because if somebody is 700 pounds, right, they might not still have their, it goes by the length. They might be seven, uh, uh, 700 pounds and, and three feet tall, right? If somebody is 700 pounds and three feet tall, they're gonna have less volume in their lungs than somebody who is 100 pounds and seven feet tall. It depends on the length of the lungs. So that's why they talk about ideal body weight. But if they don't give you a weight, then you must use one fifth. All right, let's look at the next one. The next one is alveolar ventilation. Alveolar ventilation is the gas that is perfused in the alveoli. That is what I wanna know. What part of external respiration that participates in gas exchange, right? Which part is actually participating in gas exchange and external respiration is gas exchange between the alveoli and the outside air. Don't forget that external respiration is gas exchange between the alveoli and the outside air, right? Well, I mean, the alveoli in the, in the capillary, the gas exchange from the outside air, right? How do I find alveolar mini ventilation? Now, you see this? I have to subtract what? What am I subtracting? dead space you just happen to you just have to do take away the dead space all right you just have to take away the dead space because i don't want to know the total minute ventilation i just want to know what is ventilating in the alveoli not the whole thing just what's happening in the alveoli and to do that guys you have to subtract out the dead space okay so let's look at it Alveolar dead space equals frequency times the tidal volume minus the dead space. Frequency times tidal volume minus the dead space. Because frequency times tidal volume is going to give us the whole minute ventilation. I don't want to know the whole minute ventilation. I just want to know what's happening in the alveoli, right? So I have to subtract all of that dead space out of there, okay? All right, so this is how you figure it out. I'm going to give you a problem. Mr. Smith is 78 kilograms and has a tidal volume of 500 and a frequency of 22. I want to know what is his minute ventilation and what is his alveolar minute ventilation. That's what I want to know. Mr. Smith is 78 kilograms. That's how much he weighs. He has a tidal volume of 500 and a frequency of 22. First, tell me what is his minute ventilation? And then tell me what is his alveolar minute ventilation? I wish I had some Jeopardy music. Thank you. 
Let me figure that myself. Coming up now. All right. Now, first things first. The five minute ventilation, charisma. The five minute ventilation. What am I need to use? What's the formula for minute ventilation? Uh, F times tidal volume. All right, frequency times tidal volume. So. Charisma. What's my frequency in this problem? 22. So 22 times what? 500. 500 or 0.5. Okay. 22 times 0.5 gives you what? 11. 11 liters per minute. Out of my, I mean, uh, minute ventilation is 11 liters per minute. That's the frequency, simple. Frequency times tidal volume. It's frequency 22, tidal volume 500. Now, if you did 500, you would have got what, 11,000 or something like that? You got to move the decimal to make it a to make it liters. So that's why I say do point uh, five or whatever your tidal volume is, do it point in a decimal form so it comes out in liters at the end. Okay? 22 times point five is 11. Now, now I want to know, out of that whole 11 liters per minute of gas that's moving in and out the whole system, how much of that gas is actually participating in gas exchange? That's what I want to know, because that's what's important. I could care less with the, what's going on in the conducting zone. I need to know how much is transpiring in the alveoli. So Courtney, what do I need for alve What is the formula for alveolar minute ventilation? Um, it is frequency times uh, tidal volume minus dead space. All right. So you always do what's in parentheses first, correct? Always do what's in parentheses first. So tidal volume is 500 minus what? What is his, what is his, his uh, dead space volume, uh, Charisma? I mean, uh, Courtney? 171.6. Uh, Good. 171. So you can just say 171. 171. She got that by saying 78 times 2.2. In order to convert kilograms to pounds, you so must you multiply. Say 172. It don't matter, y'all. Either one. Okay. To find the pounds, to co convert from kilograms to pounds, is take the kilograms times 2.2. Y'all got to remember that. To convert from kilograms to pounds, you must multiply by 2.2. Okay? So, because the, to find the dead space is one cc per pound. Well, I gave you his weight, but I gave it to you in kilograms. So you had to convert this to pounds. So 78 kilograms is 171.6 pounds. So if you said 171 or you said 172, it don't matter, it's gonna be close enough. All right, so 500 minus the dead space, which is 171, right, times the frequency of 22. So still doing what's in parentheses first, uh, Courtney. 500 minus 171 is what? 329. 
329. So I'm gonna write that as a decimal. 0. 0.329. So 22 times 0. 0.329 is what? 7.2. 7.2 liters. So you notice the difference? Out of all of the talk, all of this whole 11 liters per minute of regular minute ventilation, only 7.2 liters per minute is actually participating in gas exchange. Okay, let's do another. All right. This time, Mr. Smith has a tidal volume of 600, a frequency of 16, and he weighs 88 kilograms. I need to know his minute ventilation and his alveolar minute ventilation. And matter of fact, you tell me this too. Tell me his first, tell me his dead space volume. That way we everybody can do one step at a time. So his dead space volume. I want to know his dead space volume, his minute ventilation, and his alveolar minute ventilation. Out of volume of 600, frequency of 16, and he weighs 88 kilograms. First thing you need to do is convert this to pounds to get my dead space volume. Then tell me what the minute ventilation is and tell me what the alveolar minute ventilation is. All right. First things first, let's find out what his dead space volume is. Kenya, what is his dead space volume? To find dead space, it's one cc per pound. Okay. He weighs 88 kilograms. So what is his dead space? So 194. Okay. Good. So 100, 194 cc. That's it. Now, minute ventilation will be frequency times tidal volume. So uh, let's see. Uh, Lori, what is his minute, ventil minute ventilation? 9.6. 9.6. Meters. And what she did was she did 0. 
times 16. Frequency times saddle volume gives you 9.6. So this is all of it, right? He is breathing in 9.6 liters per minute. Okay? Now, how much of this 9.6 is actually participating in the magic? That's what the main question is. All right, and I'll ask, let's see who. Talisha, you with me, Talisha? Yeah, I'm with you. Okay. Uh, what is his alveolar minute ventilation? Um, my number's pretty high, but I got um, 3,072. Oh, let's look at the formula. Alveolar minute ventilation is frequency times powder volume minus the dead space. So, Talisha, what's the frequency? 16. 16 times, what's the tidal volume? Oh, that's what I did wrong. So, it's supposed to be 0.600. Well, let's work it out first. What's the tidal volume? It can be either or, Talisha. It's still going to come out with the same not, thing. Not, not at this point. I'm still doing the subtraction right now. I'm not multiplying yet. Talisha, what is the tidal volume? Is it 0.5? Oh, what is the tidal volume in the problem? 600. Oh, 600. Okay. 600 minus the dead space. You said that this, we said that this is the dead space. So what's the dead space volume? Um, The dead space volume is 193. Well, we say 194. Okay, 194. 194, right? Okay, so now let's break it down. What's in parentheses first? So let's bring the 16 down. Time. What's 600 minus 194? 406. 406. Now I'm ready to multiply. I can change it to a decimal. So 16 times 0. 0.406 is what, Talisha? Mm, okay, one second. 6.4. Oh, somebody, somebody got 6.5, either one. 6.4 liters. That's how you do it. Okay. So out of that 9.6 liters that's moving every minute, only 6.4 of that is actually participating in gas exchange. Okay? So that's how you do these, guys. You got to you have to practice, 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 which I'm going to give you a worksheet and stuff. You're going to have to work on it to practice. But this is how we're getting what we've learned so far. Okay? Minute ventilation and alveolar minute ventilation. Minute ventilation will tell us all of the gas that's moving out the whole system every minute. But the most important component is what's actually participating in gas exchange. Because the rest of this is just wasted. Right? So knowing this... There's one more component called the dead space minute ventilation, All right? And that is the fre uh, frequency times the dead space. Or you can just subtract 6.4 from 9.6 and that'll give you your dead space minute ventilation. So how much of this, look, this is what the question is saying. The whole thing, guys, is 9.6, but only 6.4 is actually participating in gas exchange. So the rest of it is wasted. How much is the rest of it? And you just subtract. So what would the rest of it be? Somebody tell me. 3.4. How much? 3.4. 3.4. So my dead space minute ventilation will be 3.4 liters. 3.4, the whole thing is wasted because only 6.4 is actually participating in gas exchange. So for the dead space minute ventilation, you can work it out like this, or you can just subtract. Once I know the total and how much is only in the alveolar, I just subtract the alveolar from the total, and that's going to give me this one. All right, so dead space is wasted gas. Gas that's just simply wasted. It's not participating in any kind of gas exchange. 
All right. All right, so as far as this gas exchange and stuff, I mean, it's gone. Alveolar ventilation, we just did that one. Let's see. Terms relating to dead space. Normal ventilation, which is eupnea, right, is adequate ventilation to meet metabolic needs. Somebody who has a normal ventilation has adequate ventilation to meet metabolic needs. And I told you we found out what the normal minute ventilation would be, six to 10, right? Six to 10, as long as they in that, that's adequate to meet metabolic needs. That's a normal, normal ventilation. Hypo ventilation is a decreased alveolar ventilation, right? Because it's, it's not enough, okay? That's not enough CO2 coming in to the alveoli to be blown out. So it's hypoventilation will cause a hypercapnia. What causes alveolar, uh, I mean, what causes hypoventilation, it says can be caused by increased dead space or a decrease in tidal volume. Either one can cause hypoventilation. If I start adding a lot of pieces to the circuit, that can cause it. Or if I slow their volume down, their tidal volume decreases, then it's going to be hypoventilation. Part C, you already know. With hypoventilation, you're going to have a CO2 greater than what? 45. And then hyperventilation. Hyperventilation is an increase in alveolar ventilation. It can be caused by a decrease in dead space or an increase in tidal volume. And start breathing bigger, then you're gonna start having a, a lower CO2, which will be less than how much? 35. 35. There you go. Now, before we go on to these units, let's go back to our Spirogram. I want to make sure everybody understands that spirogram on the board here. Let's mess with a little bit of this spirogram. Spirogram is very, very important. I'm going to put up a little, I don't even know if it's in your homework or not, but I got a little quiz. It's not for a grade, but it's something that you can be working on to try to figure these out. Again, Normal in, normal out, normal in, normal out is my tidal volume, right? Um, the amount of gas that can be inhaled following a quiet inhalation is my IRV. The gas that can be exhaled after a quiet exhalation is my ERV, right? And then the gas that remains in the lungs at all times after a following a maximum exhalation. Still going to be some gas in there. That's my RV. Okay. Now my capacities, which are in red. My capacity to inhale is my tidal volume plus my IRV gives me my IC. And my ERV plus my RV gives me my FRC. And then, of course, my volume capacity is everything I can do. So all of it I can inhale and all that I can push out from here to here. That's my vital capacity. Even with vital capacity, though, there's still some residual volume left in my lungs. Okay? And then TLC is the whole shebang. Everything. Now, so let's look at some uh, addition and subtraction of it. You need to learn how to make the spirogram uh, in your sleep, okay? You need to learn how to make the spirogram like this. You can make it in box form. It's a lot easier.
the spiral gram. The best way to do it is like this. I do this. PLC. I make me a box. Okay. Whole thing is my TLC. I always start in the middle. My VT is my title volume. What goes above title volume? IRV. Right? What goes under here? ERV and RV. Boom. Okay, now my VT plus my IRV is my what? My IRV plus VT is what? I see. I see. Inspiratory capacity. Okay. My I see. My ERV plus my RV is what? F R C. All right, now you can do this kind of like go across from here. Oh, everything that I can do is my ERV plus VT plus IRV is my what? VC or vital capacity, which RV is still there. All right. That's your spiral brown. And I didn't realize it was going to be as small as it is. Let me make it a little bit bigger. <laughs> I'm going to do some I'm gonna put pieces of paper over different parts of it so you can tell me what, what it is. There you go. That's the spiral gram. ELC is the whole thing. Title volume plus IRV is my inspiratory capacity. ERV plus my RV is my functional residual capacity. Everything that I can do is my ERV plus my VT plus my RV is my vital capacity. And of course, this is still left. So now I'm going to ask you some questions. I want you to tell me. If I do this, if I say inspiratory capacity, All right, that might be better. Now, if I was to say inspiratory capacity minus my IRV leaves me with what? I see. Out of volume. I see, because this is IC right here. It's both of these, right? This whole little thing here. That's I see. So my inspiratory capacity take away my IRV leaves me with VT. What about my FRC minus my RV leaves me with what? ERV. 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 Good. What about IC plus FRC? What does that mean? 
TLC. TLC. What about VC plus RV? What is that? TLC. TLC. What about uh what about IRV plus VT plus ERV plus RV? TLC. TLC. What about IRV plus VT plus ERV? IRV. IRV VC. See? Because VC shoots across from here up. That's VC. This is why you need to be able to, because when you have this test, I'll give you a piece of paper and you can draw that spiral grant. In your head, you got it in your head already. Oh, let me draw it and make my spiral grant. That way, when you answer questions, you can look at your paper because it, it, the memory will leave you. And you can look at your paper and say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This plus this is this, right? So you need to know how to say it in words, how to add or subtract it, and what the number is. Okay? So for instance, Inspiratory capacity is tighter volume plus IRV, or I could say maximum amount of air that can be inhaled following a quiet exhalation, right? Because this is quiet in, quiet out, quiet in, quiet out. It's tidal volume, right? So after I quiet out, everything that I can inhale is my inspiratory capacity, and it is 3.6 liters. That's what you need to know about each thing. Be able to say it in words, which is the maximum amount of air that can be inhaled following a quiet exhalation. That's one of them, right? That's one of the definitions for it. Or I can say IRV plus VT. That's another way of saying it, right? Or, uh, and then you need to be able to say, and it is 3.6 liters. Because IC is 3.6, okay? That's how you have to be able to do it. So let's look at this while we work on this worksheet here. I'm going to put a worksheet on, on the uh, share, and I want you to be working on that. And then I'm going to ask questions. Who, uh, number one, you do number two. You know, you know how we do it. Okay? Let me put it up. <sighs> We're going to do one through eight first because it'll show up on the screen and not be too small for you. I want everybody to work on one through eight. Then I will call your name and you tell me what you think it is. You don't have to tell me any actual numbers. Just tell me what does it leave, either what volume or what capacity is what I'm looking for. The answer will be in volume or capacities, not in numbers. I don't need numbers. I'm going to pause the uh, recording while you guys work on that. All right, for those who are watching this, we just did a quick little uh, quiz, spirogram quiz. This is it right here. Number one, I'm going to try to go through them and answer those questions using that spirogram chart. You can pause it, but then pause it and go over before you check your answers. And these are the answers right here. All right. All right, guys, let's keep on rolling. So I, it's very important that you understand the spirogram. It's going to talk a lot about these different volumes and capacities in the lungs. Okay, it's, it's a few of these on the test. It, it may ask you to explain it. It may ask you to what this plus this equals that. Uh, knowing the numbers in our oral exam, you have those too. It's going to say questions, say define the IC. Right? You're going to have to be able to tell them what it is and how much it is. Okay? Uh, so make sure you study that. Learn how to write that spirogram. Memorize it so that you can write it down when I give you that piece of paper for your exam. And that way you have a little bit more uh, something to help you out. Okay? All right. Now, speaking of these volumes, we were talking about Minute ventilation and all that is 4.15. Let's take another 10-minute break. Come back at 4.25.
come back at 425. That's a little fast, so it's 414. So come back at 425, and we're going to get into these, uh, more into these, this, this uh, minute ventilation, alveolar minute ventilation. Make sure we understand how to calculate those. It's not much left. Monday will pretty much be uh, working on um, some classwork, some review, right? A few oral questions, right? And so you had a whole weekend to study this, all right? And then Monday we'll come in, finish up whatever we didn't finish, if there's anything, but we still got plenty of time and it's not much left, okay? But I want you to be able to have as much as I can give you over the weekend to study it, be prepared. And so when you come in Monday, maybe we can have some, uh, do some cahoots now I have some of these questions on the actual computer where you can play against each other, the Kahoot's uh, online game. You can log in and make a fake name for yourself and answer questions, okay? So over the weekend, I'll probably make a Kahoot. I have to make one for pulmonary mechanics, okay? So let's go on and continue some of these notes. I'm at work, what's up? No, why, what happened? I don't know. I ain't gonna tell you. I don't know. I ain't got phone. Right. Mr. McCarthy, can I ask a question about this? Yeah. Yeah. What's so, up? What's up? Like in the last question, where it was TLC minus RV minus FRC, we still had the option when we blocked the boxes off to choose either VT or ERV. How do how do you know that it's VT? Is what number are you talking about? The last one. Okay. Like, how do you know when you have two options left in your box? You don't have no two options. You don't have two options, baby. This is what you have. You have, it said TLC. TLC minus minus IRV and minus FRC. TLC is the whole thing. So minus IRV and minus what? FRC. FRC. So TLC minus IRV minus FRC. What's left? Oh, okay. So you cover that whole box when you cook. Okay. FRC is ERV plus RV. That's what FRC is. FRC okay. is both of these. So if I take out the FRC and I take out the IRV, I'm only left with VC. Got it. Okay. I was just okay. reading it before it. Okay. All right. All right. Yeah, I'm not taking a break. I'm trying to okay. do something. Yeah, your own break. She just asked me a question. Oh. <laughs> mm. Shown up. Hmm. All right, so we talked about the old FRCs, dead space, ventilations. All right, ventilation and perfusion. Ventilation and perfusion is what's going with. Let me see how much is after this ventilation and perfusion. Dead space, you know, the reason I'm different. Something in dead space. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to do that on Monday. It's just two two pages left um, for, for Monday. Okay. Ventilation. So when you come in Monday, we're going to talk about ventilation and perfusion, that VQ mismatch that we kind of hinted on, but we're going to really talk about what is a. a, a are different units. What is a shunt? What is dead space? Okay. So over, you know, this weekend, you guys need to be studying, studying, studying uh, of what you've already learned. Because the only thing left is this, the regional differences and uh, uh, ventilation perfusion 
and something in dead space. Okay, and that's it. So we'll we'll knock out those out on Monday. If you have any questions in the homework that I give you that's covering something, we just do your best because it's in the reading. So read and fill those in. There's no, no reason why you can't do it. All right. Uh, homework tonight will be in um, do numbers three and four. Numbers three and four. And workbook page 120 and 121. Not the whole chapter, just those two pages. 120 and 121. Looks like this. 120 and 121. Pretty much just labeling this biogram and doing a little bit of uh, uh, definitions. Okay. In the workbook, page 120 and 121. Uh, and then homeworks number three and four. You'll upload all of that. Uh, you know, all that will be one upload. Three homeworks three and four. And then this. Two pages in a workbook. You take pictures of all of it, upload all of that for your homework uh, for Sunday, Sunday night by midnight. And then Monday when we come in, we're going to go over uh, shunting in dead space and regional differences in the lungs. And that's going to cover it, okay? We'll do a little bit of practice, um, maybe some practice oral questions, no practice test questions, but practice oral questions and um, maybe some cahoots game or something like that, classwork, and then uh, that'll be it. We'll be ready for the test on Tuesday. Test on Tuesday. All right. So I'm going to put that in as we get out. When I get off, I'm going to put the homework in. Uh, like I said, we do Sunday by midnight, and then uh, I'll put the recording in as soon as I can get it all loaded up. All right. Study your spirogram. Know it by heart by the time you get back. The amounts, where they are, this plus this is that. You know, look at this quiz that I gave about because this you looking at the recording, you can go back and look at that. Try to see if you can do it again by looking at your draw it yourself. Make sure you can do this. Very important. We're going to be talking about uh, we got a worksheet about those alveolar ventilation, minute ventilation, stuff like that. We're going to do that first when you get here. We're going to work on a worksheet that talks about uh, minute volume alveolar volume, dead space volume, then minute ventilation, and kind of breaks it down. I think you even have it in your packet. I'm not sure, but we're going to work on that for sure on Monday, okay? So homework three and four tonight. Let's see, what is it? do I have it? Yeah, that's number two, yeah. Number two, yeah, number three, yeah, okay. Three and, yeah, three and four, good. Homework three and four, I need workbook pages. And I'll see you on Monday.